And uh, <clears throat> when I first met Cal was at the National Corn Growers down in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, Cal, I, I, I started working with him actually probably a dozen years ago. It took me a lot of years to get to your dad to where he'd actually listen to me. And I finally twisted his arm to go to a program in Hastings that Todd Hoffman uh, did. Uh, along with, uh, we had Kip Callers in and we had Jerry Cox. And uh, your dad took one thing home from that meeting and it was the manganese issue. And uh, I won't take a lot of uh, Justin's story, but he went home and because of DEQ and their feed yard there, he uh, went through and went back as much as 10 years on some of them. And he found out his manganese levels because of glyphosate had gone down 30 to 60 percent available manganese in the soil. They are a big purchaser of manganese now. They've seen some really neat things there along with all of our trace elements. Um, but Cal, uh, even though he was tough to get into, he's very fair on testing stuff. And as the few years that he tested it after about the third or fourth year, he, I met him in Kearney for lunch one day, and he says, by the way, we're using your entire program from now on. And he told me, he says, basically, your cut, our input cost over 30 bucks an acre, and we increased our yields on average uh, around 25 bushel, but I'm going to give you about 15 of those bushels uh, there on, on that. So he says, that's a $75, $80 swing with uh, three and a half, four dollar corn. But uh, with that, like I said, I'm not going to get real detailed on stuff here tonight because I got the guy that's doing it every day, Justin Dahlgren. And, and as he shares stuff with you, you're going to say, I agree with that. You might say, I disagree with what Justin's doing. What we want to do is share information tonight and let you guys understand there's ways that we can help the farmer out there. And when I, can, when, when, uh, when I first started talking to your dad, you guys were farming about 5,000 acres. Now you're up around 8,000 yep. plus. They run an 8,000 head feed yard. They make sure things work for them. And Justin, I'm gonna let you share your story. And then, it's his story, guys, it's his story. Listen to what he's gonna be talking about. Again, I'm not, we're not expecting you to maybe grab everything that he's doing, but I think the faster, and I know you'll talk about this, the faster you get on the system, yep. the better it's gonna be for your operation, because you guys didn't jump whole hog the first year or two or three, but once you guys did, you guys have really, uh, just done a fantastic job. Yeah. Here, uh, let's welcome Justin Dahlgren here, guys. Well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. A uh, few housekeeping rules. I am open book. If you have a question, feel free to stop and ask me at any moment. I'm not a professional speaker. Okay, and these slides are here for me, not for you, so they're not very great, and I apologize. Um, like I said, we've been in the Conklin Company since 2014. Um, my dad was actually going to start. I was still in college. I didn't have much a part in us starting. I probably do 95 to 100 percent of it now. When I asked dad, I said I was going to be giving a little speech today. I said, "What do you think I should include in the speech?" And my dad's a man of very few words. He said, "It works. That's it. That's my speech. It's done." And I have to believe it's true. Um, like I said, we have an 8,000 head farm, 8,000 head feed, or an 8,000 acre farm. Uh, 8,000 feed feedlot, and we uh, run about 3,000 yearlings on grass every year. To uh, set the stage here, I want to talk about something. Uh, business is really simple, in my opinion, and there's only three ways you can improve a business. You can make more product, make that product for less, or sell your product for more money. Now, we're farmers. We raise yellow two number corn. You don't get to pick your price. That's awesome for you guys. You don't have to focus on two of them. That's what I'm going to focus most of my talk today is on lowering our cost production and increasing yields. Okay, but with that said, there's not one product sold today for agriculture that will change your farm economically. There's not one. There's a product that will add $50 in yield to your farm. It's going to cost $49.85 in about two years. Okay, or price corn is going to go up or go down to equate about 50 bucks an acre. That being said. A system can change your farm dramatically forever. I'll get into some of our results down the road here. And, and it, it's really true. Conklin has a system approach that will increase yields and decrease costs over time. 
And it's not only is it a system that will work for you this year, there's people that have done it for 10, 15, 20 years, and it gets better. It builds. You'll continue to lower your costs and continue to increase yields. I will say, though, that um, some products are really good. I'm not going to talk a lot about them today. There's guys in this room that can talk way better than I can. I will swear by Amplify. It goes on every acre except soybeans all the time. This is a picture of a cover crop for us side by side, one with Amplify, one without. That's probably a half rate of Amplify D because I'm not very good at math some days. Um, and it's just a home run. If you're going across the field with any type of seed, Amplify for a buck, two bucks an acre is something you can't live without. Um, I will say though, while no product can economically change your farm, Conklin has some products that might, from a holistic sense, actually change your life. Guys, if you are in an environment where you have to split apply nitrogen because you can't hold on to it, products like Guardian might allow you to skip that split application. Trust me, it's probably better to split apply your nitrogen, get the Y drop out of the culture machine, or fertigate, that's our preferred method of choice. But um, adding Guardian to the system, might actually make it to where you can go to the lake one more weekend. For some of us, that's probably worth it. Um, this is some of our products that we use. Uh, I should just say we use them all, all the time. Uh, we use a ton of micronutrients, and Conklin needs to get tanker loads cheaper, because I could use tanker load of every micronutrient every year. Um, we have a feedlot. We use a lot of manure. We can't get rid of it. Um, there's a saying, don't be a moron. Don't put more manure on. We put more manure on. We can't get rid of it. The going rate in Phelps County, Nebraska right now is we will haul it 10 miles to your field for free. We put it on. Okay, so that causes problems. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, we use everything. We're heavy, heavy into foliar feeding. When you've got excess nutrients in the soil that are tying up micros, you can only put so much in the soil without it getting tied up. Foliar feeding gives us an opportunity to actually address those needs throughout the season over the course of the year. Um, we primarily grow corn and soybeans. Uh, I used to say I don't want to talk about soybeans because they were our redheaded stepchild. I think I can now. Um, our soybean yields have gone up. I'm pretty heavily confident that if I don't grow 80 bushel soybeans underneath the pivot, I failed somewhere or we had a hail event. Um, and let me tell you, if you're looking right now and you're looking at toss up acres, I will make the case that beans will out economically yield or out economically profit your corn. And if you got any questions about that, I'll help build a system to do it. Okay, so how's it changed our bottom line? Well, from 2014, I'm going to call that my base year because we dabbled in products just enough to make sure these guys weren't full of crap. Um, we started in 2014, our, our uh, highest yield ever in 2014 was 245 bushel an acre. Um, in 2019, we did 266 bushel an acre. This year, we did 263 across every single irrigated acre. That's the whole farm. Average, that'd be over 5,000 acres. Um, so we've increased our yield significantly. We've lowered our nitrogen usage rate to about 0.72 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. That's pretty constant for us. Um, I don't want to hit too much on that. That's kind of a hidden sales tactic. In my opinion, nitrogen is cheap, um, but we definitely don't want to be putting one, 1 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. We're going to burn carbon and that's going to hurt us. That's going to hurt our kids more than it's going to hurt us, but it's going to hurt us. Um, we've lowered our cost of production. Uh, I can't give you the best stats on cost of production because um, we weren't very good at keeping track of that before I got home from college. But I can tell you what we've done since I've gone there. Um, we've dropped our cost of production down. This last year we were about uh, $583 an acre of variable cost. And that's everything but land. So um, at 263 bushel of corn and $4 cash price, we're, we're hitting home runs. There are not very many people doing that. And, and this is a chart of our three-year average corn. We've got to take out the hail and the, the crappy storm years that insurance paid us. And you can say, once we've started Conklin, it's been nothing but up. I've been starting to track our under pivot yield. I think that's something that everyone should do, separate it out, fix for the dry land areas and the other stuff. This year, we're going to be over 275 bushel an acre for 
every eight finger pivot. That's pretty, pretty impressive in my opinion. So what's Conklin done to change our farm? It increased our yields, we've lowered our cost of bushel. It's made us significantly more competitive in the, man, in the land market. I know for a fact the reason our farm has grown is because I can pay more cash rent and I know it. And still be economically positive. We've balanced our fertility. Folks, if more was better of just the bulk nutrients, there's people out here that should be growing 500 bushel corn. It's not the case. More manure is not better. If that was the case, I would be putting on a lot of nitrogen growing 400 bushel corn. It's just not the case. Um, you gotta have your micronutrients right. The more P, the more K, the more tied up your manganese, zinc, and every other micronutrient is. The other thing we've done is we've reduced risk. Um, Conklin showed us that we don't have to put everything up front. Um, if I catch a hailstorm on June 5th, I can abort mission and really change things by spreading out our nitrogen costs, not throwing near as much money at that plant up front. It's allowed us to actually save about 20, 30 bucks on insurance costs because I know that I can change plans in a heartbeat and not be out my entire production costs. So Conklin's not only helped us economically just corn and soybeans. It's actually opened up some new opportunities. Um, as we get better agronomics and better balance our soil, we've actually been able to look at some different crops. Um, I'm actually looking seriously at irrigated wheat, especially on for a chopping system, and put that in, into the feedlot and the feeding system. Um, but I can actually make a case for irrigated wheat or cover crop season. Um, hay crops, we are producing significant words, or we haven't started it, but we are gonna start doing hay. Um, we're looking at exporting nutrients off our farm. Hay is an opportunity to do that. Peas, as I said, we have a, um, we background quite a few cattle on grass. Um, I know there's some people in this room background quite a few more, but we background 3,000 head and we found that uh, supplementing those cattle uh, protein supplement is a home run where we get cheap distillers. Um, peas actually economically look really similar to, to dry distillers grain. If we can economically produce it, we're going to, and that's another product for our operation to grow. Um, and then cover crops, uh, grazing cover crops is gonna be a rotation of ours here shortly. Under pivot, $300 an acre cash rent ground, no question asked. It will be a part of our rotation. You just gotta have five wire fence around the field because your neighbor's not gonna be very happy if your yearlings bust through the electric fence and get into the corn crop. Um, we've extended our maturity selection opportunities. This year we did 98 day corn for silage. We wanted to be the first one to get the custom crews in. Did 98 day corn, did 29.4 ton an acre, and we harvested it on August 21st. That's an opportunity. Every custom crew in the world busy the day after Labor Day. Yeah, Labor Day. I was cut. That's an opportunity that's huge. 16 inch corn, that's something we're looking at. Um, I don't know if any of you guys really study the regenerative agriculture movement, different things. 16 inch row corn is something that can be is basically skipping every other row, planting cover crop in between it, looking to build your soil health, uh, plant some legume cover crops to try and help increase nitrogen add a grazing opportunity after the season. I think it could actually really reduce our cost production, reduce our risk, and up the option, and, and up our total profitability. The problem with it is, is, if you don't have a high level of management, your corn will not succeed. So, but I think we can do it, because we've got high fertility ground, and I have a willingness to manage it pretty heavily. Um, relay beans, I don't know if anybody's follows Jason Mock on Facebook or anybody who's planting wheat and beans in the same field harvesting the, you know, so you got wheat growing in like say a 60 inch row, you plant beans in between it, harvest the wheat, let the beans fill out and grow, you get two crops in one year, grow at the same time. In a high fertility field, it helps kind of manage your, your moisture and helps get the biology stimulated in the soil. Don't know if that one's gonna work for us so much, but something I wanna try. This one's real interesting. Conklin can't help us much with uh, bale grazing. I've got an excess of nutrients. A huge, huge excess of nutrients in my soil. We are actively now starting to bale cover crops after soybeans and silage. 
We're going to grow a cover crop. We're going to bale that cover crop. We're going to take that out to pasture. We're going to bale graze. And bale grazing, for those of you who don't know, is basically setting bales out in a pasture in a field and basically a checkerboard-like set of section. People who came up with it are actually people up north didn't want to start a tractor in the wintertime, feeding their cows. Okay, build an electric fence between them, let the cows into the next set of bales every single day, you don't have to start a tractor. What they didn't know when they started this is that it was actually the most brilliant way to fertilize a field. Okay, you're actually exporting nutrients and having them put it on the field rather than feeding them in a lot and hauling them around. Well, we're actively doing it for the simple fact that if we can break even, get those nutrients off my farm where I spread too much manure and out to my pasture, I'm going to economically win. We'll probably end up selling that pasture after you do it right, we'll start the process all over again. So that's what we're doing. I think that can also add a lot of opportunity in our rotation. Uh, soybean cover crop corn, really economical, three crops, two years. Um, as we start getting near the end of my presentation, uh, I have some undeniable truths. Um, some are with confidence, some without. Um, you can't starve a profit into a cow. It, it's not possible. Anyone in the cow calf has probably tried it once, they almost went broke doing it. Same goes with farming. You can't cut every, every nutrient. If you are, you better start selling your generator and naming your price. Okay, sell direct to consumer. If you're not going to do it, you can't start a profit. Be willing to spend a little bit of money. It can decrease your cost over time. But that being said, the easiest cost to cut in any cost production is always the largest one. And the largest one's always land. Look at how can we change our rotation. How can we get more solar energy captured from every acre every year? Soil testing is like a compass. Tissue testing is a GPS. And then balance beats quantity every time. Start off with that. Soil testing is something Conklin talks significantly about, and I love soil testing. It gets you pointed in the right direction, but it is not the be all end all. Tissue testing is. Just because you have enough nutrients in a soil does not mean it's getting into the plant. Folks, I put on a ton of manganese and a ton of zinc, and I still don't get enough into the plant. Every single tissue test I have says I get enough zinc into my soil. Or I have enough in my soil, and every single tissue test I have after B7 says I don't have enough to get into the plant. And I know that's economical. Tissue testing also can be hugely, hugely effective in learning where to grow. I have not found a tissue test level of boron that is too high to limit yield. Where do I have an economic level? I've gotten some up to 25 parts per million. We did 323 bushel corn this year in the NCGA contest on that one. I clearly haven't put it high enough yet. I haven't killed it. That's my fault. I should kill something every year trying to push the limits, okay? Balance beats quantity every time. This is a picture of corn I had in 2019. We were trying to push some yields here. We're putting, uh, really didn't get to dabble into strip tilling. Um, that was the first year we actually, excuse me. Excuse me. That was the first year we uh, really started pushing uh, nitrogen with our strip till rate. Naturally, we don't put on any P and K um, in the dry broadcast system, but banding nitrogen sounded like a great way to work. We put a lot of nitrogen on our corn and corn ground, somewhere close to 175 pounds an acre, which we can get away with that with the 17 CEC soil. Problem is, at V10 to V12, when our corn was racing, in a cold year, our, our potassium wasn't available in, in the soil. Potassium, for those of you who don't know, needs to be upwards of 65 to 70 degree soil temp before it becomes plant available. What that did is it created an imbalance of fertility in the soil. I had a lot of available nitrogen and very little available potassium. They go in one for one, right? It's just a pool, no matter what, equal balance of what's available. Well, when you get a, your parts per million of nitrogen over 6% in the, you get 6% nitrogen in the plant and less than two potassium, and you catch a windstorm, your corn looks like that. I could have avoided every single bit of that problem by dropping 75 pounds of nitrogen for my strip till. I was trying to push yield and it actually hurt me. I could have also fixed that by adding some potassium to the Look at potassium a little bit. 
We got Brock called sidekick, that'll do that. But balance beats quantity every time. Okay, always, 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 without question, plant your beans before your corn. Beans can take one hell of a beating. Your corn is a little wimp, okay? We've been doing this now for quite a few years, and if I could sell my 30 inch row planters and have all 15 inch row planters, I would, so I could plant every acre of beans first, and then plant corn. No questions. Kind of mentioned this earlier, temperature affects nutrient availability more than quantity, okay? I've got some soils that have 1,000 parts per million potassium. I've got one field that has a 16% base saturation potassium. For those of you who don't know, that's stupid high. That's a problem. I can be potassium deficient if I don't use the proper starter fertilizer. That's why I feel that anyone using 1034 is leaving money on the table every year, every time. Okay? Potassium is so crucial to nutrient uptake. It is actually more important than phosphorus in early season growth. It'll take up twice as much potassium in the first 40 days of its life than it will phosphorus. Any starter fertilizer that isn't complete and has potassium means you're probably leaving money on the table. That's not to mention the fact that 1034O is really high salt content and probably costing you a lot of money by burning the crap out of your seeds and reducing stand. I'll actually make a challenge to any person out here who's using 1034O to cut that back, eliminate 1034O, put in our starter fertilizer and reduce your seed cost to meet break even cost. We're talking apples to apples and I'll bet our starter fertilizer will lunch. Every time. I've done it, I've proven it. I won't do it again. 1034 0 sucks. Okay? Another undeniable truth. The people who can fail on the smallest scale the most often will make the most improvement. I want you to think about that. If you are going to grow and get better, you must try new things. If you can try something on five, 10 acres, replicated trial, and do lots of them every single year, you will find out what works faster than anybody else. Okay? If you have to do an 80 acre test track, which we used to, you get to try three things a year. Only three products, either you're gonna be very right or you're not gonna learn anything. I think the people who will actually be one of the best farmers in this country, at least agronomically speaking, are the ones who figure out how to do one acre replicated trials five times, set it up, where you can do multiple ones a year. Next one, we'll never get the correct answer unless we ask the right question. For us, it's very simple. We used to ask ourselves, how, what can we do, which one's right, okay? What can we do as a farmer, then once we got our pool of options, what's the best answer? That is totally wrong. We need to ask ourselves, what should we do how do we make it happen? Once we started switching that, we started making economic gains that we can't measure anywhere else. Okay? If you get one thing tonight, I hope it's that one. I really do. Okay, you don't have to do, okay. You don't have to do it all, but you must leverage other people's intelligence and abilities. The big one for that, you don't have to be an agronomist and be a special agronomist to farm. If you're a great farmer, if you're great at managing employees, marketing grain, maintaining equipment, you can be a great farmer. But please, hire someone who is great at agronomy. You can't get away from it. The people who are the best farmers always, always, always leverage other people's abilities and talents. That being said, you can't be incompetent when it comes to agronomy. You have to have a fundamental basis of knowledge of it. Um, study, study some, learn from somewhere, because otherwise you're going to get taken advantage of. Some of the last ones, successful farmers and ranchers spend more time working on their business than in it. I think that's huge. Um, most of us get too busy putting out fires to actually work on our business. The last one is, if it doesn't make holistic sense, it will never make economic sense. Um, it might make sense for somebody to split apply nitrogen five times. I do, and I have a 17 CEC soil. 
but I've built the system with a feedlot and employee base that I can do it. If you're a one-man band trying to cover 2,000 acres of farm ground, split applying a bunch of nitrogen is going to be a hell of a headache. Okay, especially if you do it five times. That's unsustainable if it affects your home life. Don't make any changes that will have repercussions in your personal lives. Constant learning and improvement. This is one you can take a slide, picture of if you want. Um, I think everyone should be constantly, constantly learning. That was one of the things Dennis talked about. Books that are hugely important, Hands on Agronomy, Neil Kinsey. He's gonna talk about dry fertilizer. And I have an extreme disdain for it. I think it acidifies our soil and it's not very recoverable. But his nutrient relationships and interactions in the soil, more important than anything. He's right there, okay? If you can take what he teaches you, relate it to your farm, and figure out with our program how to impact it, you'll see huge, huge results. Okay? One thing with that though, nutrient relationships. Everyone get a molars chart. Make that be your best friend. That shows the interrelationships of crops or nutrients in, in the soil. Okay? Just because you have a zinc deficiency doesn't mean you're short on zinc. It's probably because you're high on, on phosphorus. Okay, that's what the molars chart does. Other books though, uh, Dirt to Soil, Gabe Brown. I highly recommend that. The 80 20 Principle and Rich Dad Poor Dad. Uh, they're not all ag books. I have over 100 books on my Audible account. I spend a lot of time in a feed truck or in a tractor, and I never listen to the radio. Um, podcasts, uh, Working Cows Podcast, AgriTalk, you can see them up there. Um, the big one is training seminars. I think every farmer should spend at least 10 bucks an acre on improving themselves, minimum, without question. For us, that's $80,000. We don't hit that level, but I wish we would. Um, some of the big ones, DCI Next Level, um, that's Daddy Crop Innovators. I'm part of that group. Uh, that's pretty interesting with thinking. Uh, holistic Management Training with Alan Savory. Ranching for Profit, especially if you're in the cow-calf industry. I highly, highly recommend that one. That one plays on both sides, and that's mostly about business. Soil Health Academy, that's Gabe Brown School. No-Till on the Plains Conference, that's down in Wichita. Um, but the big one is Company Pro Ag Training. I don't think there's any better return on investment, dollar for time, than a $300 investment in Pro Ag Training. You will learn way more than $300, and I don't care what you make, you can afford to give in two days. I, I can tell you right now, there's a quarter of farm ground that we own because of it. That, I'm, I'm very confident in. Okay, so one last thing I'm gonna leave you with is the future of, the future of swarms of small robotic tractors. If you're not one of the best people in your county, this should scare the holy crap out of you. <laughs> it excites me. Because I, I know I've got one of the best economic outlooks on our farm. I know I'm making money every single year. And when that comes, and I can eliminate a lot of my headaches with more people, instead of trying to figure out, do I need to upgrade all the equipment? Do I need to get another big $500,000 tractor and planter combination? When one more quarter of ground, all I gotta think is, well, oh, do I need to get one more $30,000 robot? I can run all day long, all the, way, all the time. I'm here to tell you, that excites me. And I will bid every ounce of margin out of that, out of that farm ground for an old producer. If you're not great, and you're not leading, you won't be here. I, and I don't say that to scare people. I want it to be real. There's a lot of really cool opportunities in agriculture. And if you don't want to be ready to compete when this comes, you better start following the regenerative agriculture movement and figure out how you're going to sell direct to consumer. Because that's huge. My last slide is just win. Um, I don't know who listens to Tim Ferriss very often. He asks people all the time, if you had a billboard that could reach millions and millions of people every day, what would you put on it? And when I first heard that, I said, well, I use an explicit term, win, you know, it is a little effing win. And it just, it just seems true to me, okay? Everyone in this world can be winners. Most of you choose, most people choose not to be. And I think it's the effort, the constant work to be better and, and, and be a better farmer today is there. And I don't want to hear any excuses because every person on this planet can win. And I'll leave you with that. 
If anybody has any questions, you feel free to ask me, okay? Thank you.